If you've shot a gun before, then you damn well better know what propellant is. And I feel like a lot of you on this channel actually reload, so doubly so for you guys. But if you do reload, and if you're familiar with firearms even in the slightest, then you're probably aware with all of the nuances that propellant choices are going to have on the performance of your entire system. I'm Jesse, your local boondock ballistician, and today I wanted to talk with you guys about some of the different properties and considerations of propellants and their impact on performances. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Give Maisie some love in the comments below and let's get started on this autistic tangent. So starting off with some basics just to put us all on the same page here. But in the world of small cal, your propellants are largely going to be considered low explosives meaning that they do burn very slowly relative. And while it is still a fast decomposition, these reactions are going to be a subsonic combustion. Now, a lot of low order explosives can be confined and put into circumstances in which they behave high order, as if you have like overpressurized containers, whatever, doesn't matter, I'm going off already. But in the world of propellants, you have three main types here. Single base, so largely nitrocellulose. Double base, which is going to be a mix of nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. And triple base propellants, which do exist largely not in the world of small cal. Those are going to be nitrocellulose, glycerin, and guanidine. You do see those more often in large cal, but we don't care here on this channel. Well, some of us might, but I don't want to go too, too far off the rails. I do think cost is probably the biggest driver for why you don't see triple base in small cal as much. I will also say as well that small cal applications don't benefit from any of the advantages that triple base might give you. So the two combined doesn't really make sense, but it is out there, it does happen. In addition to all of those main core formulations, propellants are going to have other additions in order to control certain aspects, certain properties such as muzzle flash, your rate of combustion, hygroscopicity, hygroscopicity, um, manufacturability, so on and so forth, all of those other little fine details. But those three categories are going to be your core building blocks. If you are one of the many people on this channel who is into reloading, then you probably largely consider rate of combustion when you are figuring out what propellants you want to use, what charge rates, all of that good stuff. Typically, we associate slow burning powders with larger cases, heavier bullets. It's very common to need to use slow burning powders for more niche mill serp type loads that aren't really manufactured today but the intent is that slow burning powders can help keep those peak pressures for a sustained time there's obviously a lot of other factors that go into burn rate the cartridge shape is going to impact this available surface area within the case design as well as obviously propellant grain shape size, additional coatings that are going to be on top of it, all of that good stuff. And to boot, pressure is going to impact, of course, the potential burn rate capabilities. So like I mentioned before, shape, surface area, that's going to go hand in hand to those pressures. But basically a large case with a small neck obviously is going to be able to build up those higher pressures as the exit area is much more restricted confined so you can see already how this conversation alone just on burn rate is extremely nuanced if you've seen all of those reloading forums all of those books out there some poor guy is asking a simple question on how he should do his load for a specific use, specific round, and there are 30 answers, all very different. And this is the reason why there's really no one set solution for a single go. Obviously some are gonna be better than others depending on application, 
But the thing with this area is that there's a very broad spectrum and tweakability within any of these choices. So you can use a propellant and still have a lot of flexibility that a completely different propellant can still wind up getting you within the same ballpark performance, just obviously in different charge weights and usages. It gets complicated. Yeah, it is very overwhelming if you're trying to get into, and <laughs> this is a very good reason why. So in the world of small cowl design, this is probably a blanket of munition design, but small cowl. Typically, you have some understanding of what chamber volume is going to be when you're designing a new niche type round. For example, right, you're designing something that you know you want to be in the family of 5.56, five, so you already have your chamber constrictions established. And then from there, you can kind of take your direction on selecting what propellant shape, size, other combustion retardants or flash reducers and all of that are going to make sense. And then of course, this area in of itself is going to go very hand in hand with mechanical properties. So it would make sense, right? Different burn times mean different levels of stress and pressures on the propellants and their grain structures. So adjusting the burn rate is going to result in a change of that load, that mechanical load placed on each individual grain, which if not done, if not chosen properly, can result in premature shattering if it's not accounted for. Grain form in of itself is probably one of the most important factors when deciding propellants. Because of this, it is very nuanced and winds up impacting a lot of other factors just by itself. I just realized now that I keep throwing the word grain out there and a lot of you guys in the ammo world might just associate grain with projectile weight, weight in general, a unit of measure. Um, if it's not clear, I do mean grain in like a materials engineering microscopic kind of sense. Like if you were to look under some electron microscope, you would see the actual structure of the propellant. Um, that's your grain, right? And we know that combustion in this application is going to only occur at that grain surface. So the amount of propellant burned over time is gonna wind up being directly proportional to the surface area of your burning grains. So when you consider solid section propellants like your rods or your strips, you're gonna actually observe a decrease in possible surface area as burning progresses, right? You have your rod, it burns, the rod gets smaller, lower surface area. So naturally this would mean that you have a decelerating influence on the rate of combustion within your system, which is the reason these types of propellants are going to be considered degressive. Your tubular type of grains or propellants, uh, ones that have a single axial perforation, which is what you do typically see in small cow. So this is what we care about here typically are able to maintain their surface area as they burn. Obviously shit happens, but these ones are going to be considered neutral since the interior and exterior can kind of move at the same kind of rate. And you do see multi-perforated propellants. Usually these are associated with the world of large cal. Obviously there's other applications, but you're going to be able to see an increased surface area as these ones burn since the interior surface is actually going to be able to increase more rapidly than the outer surface is reducing. That means these ones are going to have an accelerating burn rate and they're gonna be referred to as progressive propellants. Like I said, we're here for small cow. We don't care about those other two. Neutral is where we are at. And neutral actually does help make for much more predictable reactions, which is good. We like predictable. Okay, so we've got an idea of grain form now, right? Let's talk about web thickness, which is a really weird Spider-Man-y way of saying the relationship between your initial burning surface and its intersection point with that of another. 
which is a really complicated way of saying your burn propagation, I guess, might be the easiest way to simplify that. I've said shape is important for burn rate. I stand by that, but we can kind of break that concept down further into the idea of geometry. Your shape, your grain form shape, is going to affect burn rate from ignition to completion, while your web thickness is going to affect the time required to completely burn the propellant charge. So realistically, the idea is that if you have things close together, fire can spread quickly, right? We can apply that to my house burning down, not just propellant, it makes sense. Um, further apart, obviously the longer it's going to take till everything's completely burned down, you need a lot more to propagate to the next item. In this area, the item is gonna be another structure of propellant, another little flake or ball or whatever. This is a lot easier to visualize, I think, for multi-perforated, your progressive propellants. You can kind of just consider the web thickness is going to be basically that spacing between each of those individual perforations, if that helps visualize it better. But obviously that concept applies to all types of propellants, just kind of like that spacing in between one ball to the next or whatever that time it takes from one to ignite the, the neighbor next door. In this context, if your webbing is too thin, burning can propagate obviously quickly, makes sense. But that means that there's a risk of combustion, the combustion event being completed before the projectile is able to move far enough down the bore, which is going to result in excessive pressure, temperatures, you name it. And then of course the inverse relationship for having too thick of webbing is also going to be true. I've said this a few times here, but the world of propellants can actually get way more complex as you look into other applications outside of small cal. Large cal is definitely a lot more nuanced. We can have a whole massive conversation here in regards to the impacts of charge form. Small cal is very straightforward. At this point, we're using largely only fixed ammunition types. So we have our case, right? The ignition system, the propellants, the projectile are all married together. It is a fixed unit. Easy, straightforward. But large cal applications are definitely way more complex. If any of you are artillery guys here, you know what I'm talking about. So in the broader world of energetic systems, there's gonna be a lot more considerations for different types of cased charges. But even in small cal, if you were to consider your open breech guns, something as simple as having to be cognizant of gas flow is going to impact your design choices. Since in an open breech system, right, we know some portion of that gas is going to have to be re redirected rearward in order to provide those recoil neutralizing forces. So we do have to be much more aware of how the system is moving. So for like an open breech gun design, you can compensate for this by case design, cartridge case design, but obviously burn rate concerns are going to be much more complex in this regard. But if you start to look at non-cased systems, having your propellant charge in one bag, two bags, wrapped, incremented, all of that is going to greatly change your burn characteristics. And a lot more consideration is going to have to be given to not only just the grain structures, but your charge arrangement in of itself. And to keep us in line with small cow, because I'm going to easily get very off track with this video, I did spend some time with artillery. But not to get too off track here, we're gonna wheel ourselves back a little bit. Propellant is obviously a very big conversation, but even the perfect propellant choice is going to be useless if you have a bad ignition system. When choosing your primer, your igniter, whatever, you basically need to quickly ignite the largest possible fraction of the total surface of the propellant. And if you're not able to quickly ignite that, then obviously you're gonna result in like a dud round, changes in muzzle velocities, squibs, insufficient pressure waves, a whole bunch of crappy shit, right? 
So you do need to choose a primer as well that is going to be capable of supplying enough energy to uniformly ignite your system. For the sake of not making this video too terribly long here, I do just kind of want to leave those concerns to the level of depth that I've already touched on. Look at the Maisie girl. But obviously outside of just choosing repellent type, primer type, there are a lot of other concerns and considerations from both a material mechanical perspective but also from a feasibility point of view, especially if you're doing large scale manufacturing and not just, you know, in your garage reloading, then you need to make sure doubly so that your choices are going to be cost effective, readily manufacturable, and ideally shelf stable to some decent extent. Obviously when the round is built full up, the Case design, crimping, waterproofing, all of that should tweak your shelf stability to less of a concern. But in the large scale manufacturing world, you do need to consider your lot sizes. So different propellants, different primers are going to result in a different lot being manufactured. Storage for all of these at the time, propellants are definitely fickle. So you want to make sure if you're building stuff, the propellants you're using are going to give the same performance because you will see variations between one propellant to another. Um, when you're building a line of munitions, you're going to adjust the charge weight that you're putting in to compensate for that specific propellant's performance. You're gonna have to do this every single time. So if you're not able to readily store bulk amounts of propellants and it's not going to be stable enough that while it's being stored, it's not self-oxidizing and completely destroying its own properties. Yeah, you can wind up having a lot of issues. And then obviously, like I mentioned before, factors like smoke and flash concerns are going to alter your propellant performance. So as you add in those other chemical materials to compensate for those areas, you are going to see a difference in how that individual propellant would perform without those additives. And then of course, barrel design and your weapon system are going to greatly impact what your cartridge is going to be doing. You know, even just barrel length is going to have a huge difference, but just your combustion chamber as the round is being ignited and shoved down, the way that you can combine those gases from your initiation event. Lots of other variables outside that need to be considered, but someone's gotta pick a starting point, right? And I mentioned this before, but usually your starting point is going to wind up being something like your caliber type, so the family that you want your round to fall into. A lot of the times you also have an idea of what muzzle velocity or muzzle pressures that you want the round to hit, which really just helps hone in what options are going to be available given those already established constrictions. That is all that I had for this one, guys. As always, Please ask questions below, comment, let me know if there's things that you want covered or if there is anything in this video that I didn't explain well or you want more detail on. Thank you so much for watching. I like doing these geek outs, so I'm happy even just one person likes listening to these, but I hope to see you on the next video.